Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on biblical missionaries. Is that an obvious term to you? Have you ever heard of a biblical missionary? Well, we've been studying about biblical missionaries now for nine weeks previously. Now we're on Lesson 10. And this particular one for September 5 is a discussion of Philip as missionary. Philip. Hmm. Which Philip would that be? There are several Philips mentioned in the New Testament, so we'll have to see. Let's begin with a word of prayer. I hope you have your Bible handy. We're ready to go. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for these biblical examples of people who are willing to move out of their comfort zone, to, to move out even into territories which were unknown to them, and carry the gospel to people who desperately needed to hear it. Give us the courage to speak up and to carry the gospel as, as we have an opportunity to others around us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this lesson focuses on the events connected to Philip, who was, the first, who was first chosen as one of the seven deacons and later became an evangelist to Samaritans and Gentiles. Don't you wish you knew what happened between Pentecost and that Sunday, ten days before, or that the day, seven, seven, ten days before Ascension? Um, amazing. I'm sorry, I misspoke that. Between Resurrection Sunday and Pentecost, which was ten days after Christ went after the Ascension. Christ met the disciples on several different lo in several different locations and gave them a number of challenges. Let's look at a few of those just real quickly, some of the very familiar ones. For example, at Matthew 28, starting with 18, Jesus drew near and said to them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Now, we have been studying in the past in some of our previous lessons that some of these disciples were a little hesitant to do that. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. And look at Mark 16, 15. He said to them, Go throughout the whole world and preach the gospel to the whole human race. Look at Luke 24, 47 to 49. And in his name, the message about repentance and the forgiveness of sins must be preached to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and I myself will send upon you what my Father has promised, but you must wait in the city until the power from above comes down upon you. Maybe some it took longer to get that power than others. That's mm. why they were staying in Jerusalem. I see. John 20, verse 21. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father sent me, so I send you. Did Jesus have to move out of his comfort zone? Now that can't be too difficult question. <laughs> so are you, are you kind of imagining that what they should have done was as soon as Jesus left to go to their houses and start packing? Well, what do you think Jesus intended? Well, I don't know. He, sa he, said, he said, first of all, wait until the Holy Spirit descends upon you. Right. Okay, and then what were they supposed to do? Well, okay, at that said, point, were they supposed to go to their houses? Okay, and what did he back? say? He said, go first to Jerusalem, then to Samaria, then to the other part, uttermost parts of the world. And he doesn't tell how long. I don't think he intended for it to be years and years in Jerusalem and years and years in Samaria and then finally maybe get to the Gentiles. So your answer is yes. They should have went uh, and I, started packing and I think leave. Jesus would have been delighted. Jesus said don't take anything, just your walking stick. You know, yeah. Well, I, you know, I'm putting so myself in their place. Even, even if I had the spirit, I would wonder what I should do first. Well, what we know in Jesus' own experience is he sent his disciples out to scatter out two by two in Galilee three different times. 
Then, after taking his disciples up into Caesarea Philippi and over into Tyre and Sidon and so forth, he comes down and as he's approaching the end of his ministry, he knows he's getting ready to go up to Jerusalem and being, to be crucified, he calls 72, not just the 12, but 72 men, and he sends them out to go ahead of him to all the Gentile cities. Now, in Perea, we're talking about Perea, there were a lot of Jews, but there were also mostly Gentiles. Those were Gentile cities. And he sent them out, and he expected them to go and carry the gospel to Gentiles right there. All right, but with all that stuff you're talking about, they always came back home. Well, of course. What's, well, when what's you go out that? into the world, you're not coming back home. When you go to all those places... Peter, I mean, Paul and Barnabas went out, came back, went out, and then we went with Silas, well, that went out, was came after back. everybody got split off, after the well, persecution started, that, that made be. them go out. But I'm trying to ask you the question, should they have just started packing and leaving at that point? To me, I, I would kind of wait for instructions to, to go. I would know that I'd have to go, mm -hmm. but I would wait for instructions, or wait for the reason, or get, wait for a vision Wait for something to go. When Pentecost came, that was their cue. You've got the power, you've got the language skills, you've got the message, go. Okay, so you're saying that they should have went to the, their houses and packed and left. What, let, me, let me just ask this question. What, do you think, what, what did they think he meant when he said, go to the outermost parts of the world? What do you think they thought when well, Jesus said it's, that? It's obvious, but my question is, What's the first step to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so d is it something that you figure out and then you start going out on? Or do you, do you wait till the no circumstances? Do you, do you wait till the circumstances come up to kind of point the direction mm -hmm. and say, okay, it's now it's time to go? But Gary, you, would, don't you think there would be some sort of organization and we didn't want everybody going to one city because that's where they thought they should go? They were spread out all over. So how, how would they know to be spread out all over if there wasn't somebody saying, you need to go over here and you need to go over here? Well, you're you kind of making my point because how would they know that? It's, it's well, the persecution that started, which was providential of God, that kind of was think, almost like a plan that was supposed to happen. You think the persecution said, okay, you, I'm going to persecute you, so you go there and carry, I'm going to persecute him and he's going to go over here? Or they just they just ran. Well, they just ran, but that's fine because that that still fulfills the commission. <laughs> okay. They just took off. Okay. They started going. Hello. But what I'm saying is that that are you sure that they did something wrong by staying around, by not going, well, and waiting like until the Lord came with the, His providence to make it happen? Do you think God was happy to have to send persecution to scatter them? Do you think a bunch of Christians had to die before they finally got the idea that maybe we ought to leave Jerusalem? Well, that's kind of hard to answer. <laughs> that's, not really, that's not really a slam dunk, if you ask me. Okay. Well, was it well, God sending, or was it them not wanting to move that brought it upon? I think it's both. But I also think we've missed one thing there, that not everybody was the same. That's obvious, but some were married, some were not. Mm -hmm. It was easier for single people to go certain ways. If you had a family, mm -hmm. did you take them? Did you leave them in Jerusalem and come back? That's why some of them did. Do, do, they you were think, wasting time. They needed shaking up. Do you, do you think the, the call to go to the uttermost parts of the world is still valid? In a sense, yes. But I, I think we need to use our own world around where we live better than we've done. Yeah. Well, and that's part of the question. Does that mean... Go to the uttermost parts of the world. Does that mean we need at least five Adventists in every country in the world? Well, you can take it literally like that, or you can do what you do here at this table. This reaches a pretty broad audience around the world. Yeah. Does it mean that we actually need to say, give at least a little bit of the gospel message to every man, woman, and child on planet Earth? How long? How much difficult would that? How difficult would that be? Well, With the internet and television, it's not difficult. Depends on it how long you've, how people. long you've lived in rural Africa. Yeah. But like I, I have. Even, even rural Africa yes. has. They internet. have phones. Yeah, they have cell phones. Some of yeah. them have internet. You you alluded to this earlier on. You you 
we are getting people coming in from some of the most outer limits of yeah. the world asking they've had dreams asking for a certain man and when they got looking around you're the one I saw in the dream they've yep. come across Sabbath keepers that yep. we've never known anything about within the last year 18 months and mm -hmm. it's all through shortwave radio there's a story in our Sabbath school lessons if you read it uh, about a man in Bangladesh who found a Bible floating in a river yep. and he was out there and the Bible didn't get destroyed floating in the, down this river. I don't know how long it had been there. I mean, I, I, seemed, I think the only possibility there was that God was protecting it from being destroyed. Where it came from, nobody knows. Of course, this guy ends up being an Adventist from that Bible. Well, the word Philip, just a little bit of background, means horse lover. It was a pretty common name back in those days. Two of the Phil There are four Philips mentioned in the New Testament. Two of them are members of Herod's family. I think we will ignore them for right now. Mm -hmm. The first Philip that we know about uh, among the disciples and so forth was was one of the disciples and he came from Bethsaida up the northern end of the of the Sea of Galilee and what do we know about him he was one of the very first disciples to be called and what did he do when God was it Matthew when God Nathaniel. somebody Nathaniel. he Nathaniel. went and called Nathaniel, Nathaniel. Yeah. how come we never hear about Nathaniel later among the when Jesus counted out the disciples, there's no Nathaniel. Bartholomew is the same. He Bartholomew means son of Ptolemy. So presumably his name was Nathaniel Bartholomew. So same person. During the final week of Jesus' ministry, some Greeks approached Philip, this is the same disciple, and said that they wanted to see Jesus. We do not know exactly what, who these people were or how they heard about Jesus. Maybe they by accident ran into the the triumphal procession on that Sunday. Or maybe they just heard everybody whispering, is he, is he going to be king? Is he going to be king? What about this Jesus? Is, when is he going to be king? Well, what did Philip do? He went to Andrew. Was he a little reticent? Was he a little afraid to approach even Jesus? That seemed a little strange at this point in time. But Philip went to Andrew, and the two of them apparently took the Greeks to see Jesus. And what happened? Well, led to um, quite a display. Led to quite, look at that. Some Greeks were among, I'm reading from John chapter 12, starting with verse 20. Some Greeks were among those who had gone to Jerusalem to worship during the festival. Now, we don't know whether these were Gentile Greeks who just became a little bit interested in Jewish religion and showed up for that reason, or whether they were Jews who now spoke Greek, who lived in some Greek-speaking territories, and now they're coming back to worship. We don't know. They went to Philip, he was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Thelman blepen yesun. Philip went and told Andrew, and the two of them went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has now come for the Son of Man to receive great glory. What does that have to do with these people who want to see Jesus? Well, I am telling you the truth, a grain of wheat remains no more than a single grain of that is dropped into the ground and dies. If it does die, then it produces many grains. Those who love their own life will lose it. Those who hate their own life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever wants to serve me must follow me so that my servant will be with me where I am and my father will honor anyone who serves me. So now we've had a, a, a mini speech. Okay. Now my heart is troubled. And what shall I say? Shall I say, Father, do not let this hour come upon me, but that is why I came so that I might go through this hour of suffering. Father, bring glory to your name. He still hasn't said, yeah, hi, how are you? What's going on here? Then a voice from heaven spoke, I have brought glory to it and I will do so again. And everybody, I mean, imagine if you're standing in the temple courtyard and there's a voice comes booming out of the heavens. The crowd standing there heard the voice and some of them said it was thunder, while others said an angel spoke to him. But Jesus said to them, it was not for my sake that this voice spoke, but for yours. Is he talking about the, the, the Greeks? Now is the time for this world to be judged. Now the rule of this world will be overthrown. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. 
and saying this, he indicated the kind of death he was going to suffer. Now, what was that all about? Well, we know a little bit about a couple of things. At his birth, who came to celebrate his birth? The wise men from the east. The magi, the wise men from the east. He's about to die three or four days later, and who's come to see him now? Greeks. Inquirers, Greeks from the West. Now, I, I, I think maybe this is why Jesus said what he did. He now says people from all over the world are coming to learn about me, and now's the time, you know, then I'm going to have to die. It seems like he was using the situation to educate the disciples that were present, plus yeah. reply to the Greeks. He's it's sort of a two-header here. Yeah. Well, we need to leave that Philip now. We need to talk about the Philip that the lesson mainly focuses on. And that's the Philip who was chosen to do what? Distribute the funds to the widows. Distribute food and goods and maybe some money to what widows? Greek-speaking widows. Yeah. Especially there, you know, here's these people. They're all living together in almost a commune kind of a situation. They're sharing what they have. People are selling property and bringing in money so that everybody can have enough. It was a great time of fellowship. And, and the other people in Jerusalem, they, they, they really wanted to be a part of the group. People came in. This is wonderful. The, the spirit we can see here is marvelous. But, of course, the devil is not happy to have that kind of thing. He had to interrupt sooner or later. And what happened? The Greek-speaking widows felt like they were being discriminated against in favor of the Aramaic speaking widows, the, the local women. And what happened? What did the disciples say? And the, well, the whole, well, what did the disciples say first of all? Let's select some people to yeah. deal with that. We, we, we've got our job, job cut out for us. We're supposed to be speaking, speaking the gospel and spreading the news around to people. Pick some people who are good at this and assign them the, do the job of equally, fairly distributing to the widows, right? Are you suggesting the discrimination they felt was invalid? Yes. I mean, a as Christians, they were supposed to be spreading everything equally. Now, it's interesting to notice that there were seven deacons chosen. What do we know about them? Well, we have names. What do the names teach us? They were all Greek names. They were all Greek names. Do you suppose there was any politicking going on? Maybe. We don't know whether they were true Greeks or Jew, Jew, uh, Greek-speaking Jews. Probably Greek-speaking Jews, considering where we were in, in history here. Well, it was Philip who preached the gospel. To, oh, I'm sorry, let me back up a second. So these men are chosen to assist in, what, in the position of what we would call deacons, to assist the gospel. And what was the result? I think things simmered down and people were relatively happy and it let the others among do the, their among, evangelizing. Among the Jews. But what happened next was, if you read the story, we don't have time to go back and read all the verses, Stephen especially, the leader of the, this group, was such a powerful arguer about Christianity, he went to the Greek-speaking synagogues and nobody could answer him. He just bowled them over with his, with his arguments. And the, the, especially the Pharisees were not happy. I mean, imagine the Pharisee gets up and he conducts the meeting and then Philip's, I mean, Stephen stands up and just refutes basically everything he said and said, you all need to be Christians. I mean, what kind of response would he get? We gotta get rid of this guy, right? And so, of course, he ended up being stoned. Well, he was called before the Sanhedrin, and he gave that marvelous speech in, in Acts 7, and then he ends up being stoned. And what was the result? Time of terrible persecution. persecution yeah. Well, Ellen White says these words. This is Sketches from the Life of Paul, page 204, paragraph 1. It was Philip who preached the gospel to the Samaritans. It was Philip who had the courage to baptize 
the Ethiopian eunuch. For a time, the history of these two workers, now we're talking about a time now that Paul is coming back on his way to Jerusalem and he stops at Philip's home. For a time, the history of these two workers, Philip and Paul, had been closely intertwined. It was the violent persecution of Saul the Pharisee that had scattered the church at Jerusalem and destroyed the effectiveness of the organization of the seven deacons. The flight from Jerusalem had led Philip to change his manner of labor and result in, in his pursuing the same calling to which Paul gave his life. So what's the result of this persecution? Philip ends up doing what Paul ends up doing later. Precious hours were those were these that Paul and Philip spent in each other's company. I mean, I'm sure Philip must have said, I can remember the days that we were scared to death of you. <laughs> Thrilling were the memories that they recalled of the days when the light which had shone upon the face of Stephen upturned to heaven as he suffered martyrdom flashed its glory upon Saul the persecutor, bringing him a helpless suppliant to the feet of Jesus. Wow. Try to, be, try to imagine being a part of the Christian group starting out at the time of the Pentecost and growing into the, until the time of Stephen Stoney. What, what do you suppose is going on in the group at that point in time, and that, over that period of time? The church wasn't shrinking, right? No. Let me read you a couple of verses. Look at Acts chapter 6. I can get my machine to work here. Acts chapter 6, verse 7. The word of God prospered. The number of disciples in Jerusalem... Um, hold on. I'm, well, I've gotten a different translation, but that's all right. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased dramatically. Not least, a great number, a great many priests submitted themselves to the faith. Who were the priests in those days? Sadducees. Sa mainly Sadducees. And look at, we've already talked, well, we've talked about this in our previous lessons. Look at Acts 15, verse 5. Acts 15, verse 5. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, da-da-da-da. So, where is the gospel spreading to? The power structure in, the, in Jerusalem. The power structure in Jerusalem, and that means probably to a whole lot of other people. Well, we know thousands. Thousands were, basically became Christians in a single day. 3,000. And how long after uh, Christ's death is this? Well, the Pentecost, the thousand, that was 50 days after his death. Just the stoning of Stephen was three and a half years later. The stoning of Stephen is three and a half years later. Okay. Yeah. So this was a time of great community, of fellowship, of sharing almost everything. Thousands of people joined the group of Christians. They met regularly in the temple and in private homes. But sooner or later, there had to be some disagreements rose up. And we've already mentioned it was about whether or not there was fairness and distribu distribution to the widows. In order to deal with that problem, what did the disciples do? We've already talked about this. They chose these seven deacons. So what was Philip's first Christian job? Deacon. Well, looking after tables, basically, right? Well, um, what do we know about the background of this Philip? Do we know much at all? Virtually nothing. Yeah. Virtually nothing. Was he an earlier follower of Jesus before this experience? Possibly. Was he married? Well, we know he had daughters 20 years or so later. So presumably he was married with children maybe already. Later, when Paul recommends who should be deacons, he says they should be married men. Did the early Christians follow those guidelines? If so, Philip must have been married. Um, so Philip takes off and he goes to Samaria, presumably with his family. Do you think it was easy for him to move to Samaria? 
beat the persecution in Jerusalem. <laughs> beats, uh -huh. the, beats the persecution in Jerusalem. That's about the size of it. Well, what, who, what happened ahead of him that might have made it a little bit easier? Well, it, from the earlier remarks and what we know, things were getting unwieldy. They had to start organizing, and he'd probably rub shoulders with a few of the types of people, nationalities of where he ended up. Possibly, very possibly, yeah. But remember, Jesus had actually spent some time in Samaria, hadn't he? Yeah. yeah. The widow at the well of Sych in Sychar? Yeah, Sorry. not a widow. A woman at the, the well. Woman. Yeah. A woman. A woman with multiple husbands. Yes, okay. <laughs> so what do we know about these Samaritans? Well, way back 732, 700, I mean, it's 23, 22 years before what we think was the birth of Jesus wasn't actually the birth of Jesus, but 723 to 722 BC, the Assyrians came down from the north, very powerful and very warlike nation. They conquered the northern nation of Israel. They scattered the Israelites, little groups of them here, there, 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 all over the place. And then they took people, so there was only a few Israelites left in the nation. Then they took people from all over and other parts of their kingdom and settled them here in, in, in Palestine, in, in Israel. Why did they do that? Spread them around. The idea Literally. was to keep them, keep any, no one group would be large enough by themselves to start a revolution, start a rebellion against the government. Yeah. Well, so what happened? If you go back and read the story, they believed in those days that each territory in the world had been assigned to a particular god. And you had to worship that god and that territory. So they went searching some Levites that had been scattered out among their territory. They said, come back here and teach these people in Samaria how to worship the god of Samaria. They actually brought back some Levites. And they did. They, but, and so they, the people who, who came there and intermingled with the, and intermarried with the few Jews that were left there, a few Israelites that were left there. We shouldn't call them Jews because Jews is a term for Judah and that's the southern kingdom. The few Israelites that were left there intermarried with them, but they regarded themselves as being descendants of at least Israelite tradition. But the Jews, looking at them, said, you're foreigners, you're no Israelites. Yeah, you and so, the, what? They bloodline. Yeah. <clears throat> There had been fighting going on between these two groups since the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. Sometime later, around about the year 150 BC, one of the Maccabean sons conquered the Samaritans and forced them to pay tribute, and he just even destroyed their temple. So when Peter arrived in Samaria, when now, talk, yes? When Philip arrived. I'm sorry, when Philip arrived in Samaria, his task suddenly changed. He's no longer a distributor to widows. What's he doing now? He's become a foreign evangelist, hasn't he? Evangelizing. Well, if the example of Stephen is any indication, Philip may have already been a very effective evangelist. But at least we are sure that Philip was no longer dealing primarily with widows. Well, those who have observed the church's work in foreign countries will recognize immediately that many missionaries have been sent overseas only to find that they have needed to do jobs that are quite different from what they had thought they were going to do. Gordon, I know your parents were overseas. I went overseas. Did they end up doing some things they didn't expect to be doing? Absolutely. <laughs> you end up doing what you have to do. Mechanic included. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Well, look at Acts 8, 6 to 15. We probably don't have time to read this whole passage. The crowds paid close attention to what Philip said as they listened to him and saw the miracles that he performed. Evil spirits came out from many people with a loud cry, and many paralyzed and lame people were healed. So there was great joy in that city. A man named Simon lived there, who for some time had astonished the Samaritans with his magic. He claimed that he was something great, someone great, and everyone in the city from all classes of society paid close attention to him. Um, he is that power of God known as the great power, they said. They paid this attention to him because for such a long time he had astonished them with his magic. 
But when they believed Philip's message about the good news of the kingdom of God and about Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself also believed, and after being baptized, he stayed close to Philip and was astounded when he saw the great wonders and miracles that were being performed. I mean, this wasn't just magic. This was real power going on here. So what was the result? The apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had received the word of God, so they sent Peter and John to check things out, right? When they arrived, they prayed for the believers that, had been, that they might receive the Holy Spirit because they hadn't yet received. They'd been baptized but hadn't yet received the Holy Spirit. So what happens next? Well, let's skip the story of Simon. Peter and John also had to deal with Simon, who had been astonished by the Samaritans, wanted to buy this power. What did, how did Peter respond to them? Maybe I should read that. That's pretty shocking information. Look at Acts 8, 17. Um, sorry, it's, it's verse 20. The, it's verse 20. But Peter answered him, May you and your money go to hell for thinking that you buy God's gift with money. I don't know if that's exactly what he said, but it was pretty forthright. Well, so what happens next? The next thing we read about is a trip that Philip took, right? Where did he go? South. South. To the road that went down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And from Gaza to where? That would take you on to Egypt and then further points south, right? And who was driving, who was traveling on that road? Ethiopian. Ethiopian. He'd come a long way. Uh, what was called Ethiopia in those days was probably more closer to what we would call Sudan today, but that's okay. He was trying to read a portion of scripture which we now recognize as Isaiah 53, 7 and 8. Let me read those verses. He was treated harshly but endured it humbly. He never said a word like a lamb about to be slaughtered, like a sheep about to be sheared. He never said a word. He was arrested and sentenced and led off to die. And no one cared about his fate. He was put to death for the sins of our people, and so forth. And if he went, on, had time to go on, which I'm sure Philip did, he was placed in a grave with the wicked. He was buried with the rich, even though he had never committed a crime or ever told a lie. So is this man, this man has to be reading this in Hebrew. Not necessarily. He probably was reading it in Greek. Okay. Probably a Greek version. Well, do we know how this Ethiopian had, why he came to Jerusalem? And apparently he had decided to become a Jew. Someone must have preached something to him. Do we know anything about that? No. How much, yes? Well, I was going to say, that isn't there, is, uh, they're going to put this some indication that uh, the Queen of Sheba and Solomon had gotten together? I yes. I mean, we, there are Ethiopian Jews now that some migrated to Israel and some would like to and haven't and can't. Mm -hmm. So there's been something going on there for a long time. Well, how did this Ethiopian decide to become a Jew? Maybe he was one of those descendants of Solomon. How much of the gospel did he learn from Philip? We don't know. Did he ever go back to Jerusalem to get further instruction? We don't know. Apparently, Philip used that occasion to explain to the eunuch about the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's what's specifically mentioned. What points about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ would you want to mention in a brief encounter with someone? Thought about it? <coughs> Excuse me. Depends upon their background. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you'd want to find out first a little bit about what they knew already, right? Yes. Well, what else do we know about Philip? Anything else? Transported miraculously. He was transported miraculously, and where did he? Where was he transported to? A point on the coast, and he traveled from there on up the coast to Caesarea. And we don't know if this was his first opportunity to visit Caesarea and led to his later coming there. We don't know. Just a brief point. So, Philip, so this Ethiopian, just in this apparently short ride. Mm -hmm learned enough to be baptized. Mm -hmm. Is that what we should be doing, giving 
a two well, hour, three hour uh, Bible study and they baptizing weren't, they Things traveled fairly slowly in those days. And they may have had more time than you might immediately suspect. Um, Philip may have spent some hours with him. But, I mean, we, we have to assume that he already knew somewhat about Judaism. I mean, he, was, he traveled a long way to come to Jerusalem to, to worship in the temple there. So that would be a start. Another paradigm shift. Yes. Well, 23 years later, Philip was now living in Caesarea. It was the late spring of AD 58. Paul and his friends were taking the offerings from the Gentiles to the church in Jerusalem. We read in Acts 21, 7 to 10 that they landed at Caesarea. Look at those verses. We continued our voyage, voyage sailing from Tyre to Ptolemy, where we greeted the believers and stayed with them for a day. On the following day, we left and arrived in Caesarea. There we stayed in the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven men who had been chosen as helpers in Jerusalem. So it's pretty clear who this was, right? There's no if, ands, or but there. He had four unmarried daughters who proclaimed God's message. In the more traditional translations, it's they, they were called prophet, prophetesses. What do you suppose it would take for a young unmarried woman to be called as a prophetess? A lot. Mm -hmm. What does that tell us about Peter's home? What does it tell us about the role of women in the church then and today? Fair enough. Well, he's, Paul spent some wonderful days with Peter and his family. We do not know exactly what they were doing, but it is certainly a wonderful testimony to Philip's home instruction. How did Philip manage to be so successful raising his daughters to serve God? We don't know. What did the example of Peter, Philip's daughters have to say about the role of women in the church today? That's a good question. Try to imagine the discussion between Philip and Paul. Remember that it was Paul's persecution of the Christians in Jerusalem that forced Philip to flee from his job as a deacon. So what do you think they talked about? You think Philip said, what happened to you, Paul? <laughs> he already had heard, I'm sure, rumors. What do we know about Philip's wife? Nothing. Nothing. Was he married before he was chosen as one of the deacons? We don't know. Had he been one of the lesser known followers of Jesus earlier? We don't know. But apparently Paul and Philip had a wonderful time together which extended to a number of days. So Paul apparently felt He'd been rushing and rushing to get to Jerusalem, and now he's within a couple of days' walk, maybe, of Jerusalem. And what does he do? He no rush. So, what would these two have in common that they would might spend so much time talking about? Well, they were doing by this time. They were doing similar work. Yeah. They were carrying the gospel to the Gentiles, huh? Yeah. I'm sure they had lots and lots of stories to tell. Some days maybe we'll get to hear those stories. In retrospect, maybe Paul should have stayed there longer. Yeah. And not gone to Jerusalem at all. Been arrested and eventually killed. Mm -hmm. Well, remember that after being arrested and tried briefly in Jerusalem, Paul was whisked away from Jerusalem to preserve his life. Remember the story, what happened? How much do we know about Paul's family? One thing. Well, two things, one maybe thing. There's pretty good evidence that you had to be married to be a member of the Sanhedrin. So Paul must have been married at some point. We also know that he had a sister, and that sister had a son. How do we know that? I have no idea. I didn't was know that, he had that. Was that Timothy? No, 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 that? no. Well, I thought that was all familiar territory. <laughs> Hold on a second. Let's let's look at that. Um, go to Acts, and it should be about let's see. Um, 
Okay. Da, 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 da. It would be Acts 21. I'm, I want to read it to you. Um, no, I'm sorry. It would, it would be Acts um, 23. Starting with verse 12. The next morning, some Jews met together and made a plan. They took a vow that they would not eat or drink anything until they had killed Paul. Remember this story? There were more than 40 who planned this together. Then they went to the chief priests and elders and said, We have taken a solemn vow together not to eat a thing until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the council send word to the Roman commander to bring Paul down to you, pretending that you want to get more accurate information about him. But we will be ready to kill him before he ever gets here. But the son of Paul's sister heard about the plot. So he went to the fort and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the officers and said to him, Take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. The officer took him, led him to the commander, and said, This prisoner, Paul, uh, the prisoner Paul, called me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to say to you. The commander took him by the hand, led him off uh, by himself, and asked him, what, do you have to, what have you got to tell me? He said, The Jewish authorities have agreed to ask you tomorrow to call, take Paul down to the council, pretending that the council wants to get more accurate information about him. But don't listen to them because there are more than 40 men who will be hiding and waiting for him. They have taken a vow not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are now ready to do it and are waiting for your decision. The commander said, Don't tell anyone that you've reported this to me, and he sent the young man away. Then the, two, the commander took, called two of his officers and said, Get 200 soldiers, 200 soldiers ready to go to Caesarea, together with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen, and be ready to leave by 9 o'clock tonight. So Paul is escorted from Jerusalem with a retinue of 400 plus soldiers. Would that be two centurions? And well, that would be, that would be four. four centurions. That would be incredible. But there's the story. Okay. Hmm. And so, where is Paul headed? Back to Caesarea. He came from Caesarea, and now he's going back to Caesarea, being escorted by a huge group of Romans. I was wondering if those 40 men kept their vow. Yeah, I wonder. <laughs> I wondered that too. Got awfully hungry. <laughs> yeah. Well, how long was Paul in Caesarea this time? It was two years, wasn't it? More than two years, probably. And as we can, can't eat, we don't know exactly, but probably more than two years. And why, why was he stuck there? The Jews kept trying to bring accusations against him so that the Romans would, would hand him over or kill him in one way or another. And he always shot down their arguments completely. And finally, what did he do there? He said, if you're going to try me, I'm a Roman citizen, I appeal to Caesar. But during those two years, he's in Caesarea. And who else lives in Caesarea? Philip. Philip. You think they ever had an opportunity to get together? We don't know. We don't know how tight the prison was on around Paul. Um, it's quite possible. It's very possible that Philip was allowed to, and Paul may even have been allowed to go to Philip's house on occasion. Well, we do not know how long Philip stayed in Samaria, or whether he went directly after, after that to Caesarea. In any case, he conducted a very successful missionary program. And I quote Acts of the Apostles, page 106. When they were scattered by persecution, they went forth filled with missionary zeal. They realized the responsibility of their mission. They knew that they held in their hands the bread of life for a famishing world. And they were constrained by the love of Christ to break this bread to all who were in need. So, sounds like Philip didn't have a problem with preaching to Gentiles. Reading on Acts of the Apostles a little bit later. And 106, paragraph 4 and 107. And when the, his disciples were driven from Jerusalem, some found in Samaria a safe asylum. The Samaritans welcomed these messengers of the gospel, and the Jewish converts gathered a precious harvest from among those who had once been their bitterest enemies. So, what's happened here? 
We started out with what? Among the Christians. A dispute about widows, right? And what happened? Deacons were, seven deacons were chosen. And what was the result after that? All the stuff we've been reading about, right? Mm -hmm. The deacons become preachers. Very effective preachers, I might add. Huh? There's a verse that describes something we might be talking about here. It's found in Romans 8, uh, verse 28. Let me put it higher up on the screen. We know then all things God works for good with those who love him, those whom he has called according to his purpose. So, what's happened here? We start out with a fight among Christians or a dispute among Christians. We end up choosing some deacons who work for a while serving tables. And then what happens? They go out and become very, very effective. Two of the, the two that we know about became very effective evangelists, right? So much so that Philip was called, well, Stephen, we know what he did. Philip was called an evangelist. Well, it's too bad the differences arose between the Hebrew-speaking widows and the Greek-speaking widows in the early church. It resulted in a wonderful experience of choosing these seven deacons. Today, the Seventh-day Adventist church is scattered over almost all the world. How can we make sure that we do not allow cultural, social, or other barriers to divide us? Would there be if all the Christians... Well, in fact, I know that there's a meeting of Seventh-day Adventists... Um, it takes place about every five years and people come from all over the world. Are there any disagreements at those meetings? There have been. There have been. <laughs> <laughs> well, even if the church's evangelistic programs today are very successful and assuming we manage to eliminate prejudices, imagine what it would be like if we had a church group that had eliminated all prejudices. We need to remember that if the church is very successful at reaching people of all classes and accepting them without prejudice, don't you think a lot of people would like to join a group like that? It will result in even more people being attracted to the church and they will join with their biases and prejudices to work on, right? So the hospital is not a club for saints, it's a what? The church is not a ho hospital. It's the a church what? Is a hospital. The church is a hospital. Not a club for saints, it's a hospital for sinners. So, we've discussed this a little bit, but did God have to allow persecution to come to the believers in Jerusalem in order to get his people to move out of Jerusalem so that they would speak to Samaritans and Gentiles? Yes. Seems, seems like it, doesn't it? What sort of early training do you think Philip got? Well, as a young Hebrew boy, what was he supposed to do? He should have gone to one of the synagogue schools, right? But the most important aspects of his training were probably in the Christian community during the time he served as deacon, or maybe even before that. On what basis were the deacons chosen? We don't really know, do we? Well, Paul later has some things to say about that. Do you remember? I got that. Look at 1 Timothy 3, 8 to 13. Church helpers, that's another word for deacons, must also have a good character and be sincere. They must not drink too much wine or be greedy for money. They should hold to the revelation, to the revealed truth of the faith with, clear, with a clear conscience. They should be tested first, and then if they pass the test, they are to serve. Their wives also must be of good character and must not gossip. Boy. Hmm, I wonder how many people would qualify here. They must be sober and honest in everything. A church helper must have only one wife and be able to manage his children and family well. Whoa. Boy, the, the bar is being raised. How many pastors would qualify here? Though these, those helpers who do their work well win for themselves a good standing and are able to speak boldly about their faith in Christ Jesus. Maybe, that, maybe that's what came out of their discussions earlier on, Paul and Philip. Yeah. Do you think Paul remembered as he went on his way and as all those years he worked in his evangelism that his first Christian sermon came from a deacon? He 
probably what was a smart guy he probably had his time where he had to sit back and reconsider a whole lot of stuff all his life three years out in the Arabian desert yeah 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 fruit basket upset well, Philip, we know, fled persecution, confronted the sorcerer, preached to unbelievers, cast out demons, witnessed to a high official of the Ethiopian royal court, and discovered what it meant to be surprised daily by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That must have been an exciting life. Could some of us today who dedicate our lives faithfully to spreading the gospel have experiences similar to those which Philip had? Do we need a whole bunch of Philips? The disciples have been told that they were to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. For the first century Romans, Greeks, and Jews, Ethiopia was probably considered to be the ends of the world, right? Ends of the earth, probably. So how many miracles do you think Philip performed in the course of his ministry? Was his miracle working power one of the things that attracted people to him? Seems like it from what we read earlier, doesn't it? Lots of miracles recorded. Yeah. Well, why do you think it says Philip baptized them, but it wasn't until Peter and John came that they received the Holy Spirit? Were only, only the disciples allowed to dispense the Holy Spirit? Is that what made it possible for him to perform miracles, or did he perform miracles before that? I'm asking a lot of questions we don't have the answers what, to, right? What do you think is the answer to the Philip baptized with water, but the, uh, the disciples came and baptized with the Holy Spirit? Why the difference? We know that later Paul did it, so it wasn't just the disciples. Yeah. I think maybe they, they felt that they needed to expand on Philip's experience. Maybe they thought he needed a little extra instructions, and that's what they did. How well do you, do you think Philip understood the Samaritan audience, uh, culture, and customs? We've spoken a little bit about this before. How, is it important for missionaries to understand their audience? Definitely. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that the better we know our audience, the more effective we are, our witness will be. In their early days down in the Pacific, if you touch the chief's head, you could get yours taken off. Right. Right there. Yeah. Well, and, and lots of things. Uh, um, if you go to, uh, there's a book I, I read some time ago, a great book, um, by a, an Adventist missionary who went to Thailand and learned a lot of things about the customs over there, made some serious mistakes and learned from those mistakes. You know, I, I don't think we need to go into Thai culture right now, but they have some very strict rules that you don't, yes. that you don't, you know, don't cross the, line. cross the line. How would you like to be sent as a missionary to China right now? I don't know if some of you people remember, you probably don't know this, but we used to have a member of our Sabbath school class, a, a couple used to be in our Sabbath school class that spent several years as missionaries of, well, they were, they, they were, quote, English language instructors in China. I had some very interesting experience. In fact, at one point in time, they were in English language instructors up close to the North, North Korean border. They seem to have been successful as long as they kept within the parameters of the communist government and had a lot of success. Okay, how would you like to be sent as an Adventist missionary to the Muslim world right now? would depend where. Yeah. yeah. How about to Iran? Yeah, or Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Or Syria. How about Syria right now? Or Libya. <laughs> or Libya. Yeah, exactly. So but during a time of trouble, do you think they'll still be missionaries? I think everybody who's a Christian in those days will be a missionary in one way or another. I think we will have to stand up, and some may even die, but we'll have to stand up in court 
will have to witness before newspaper reporters and so forth like that. And those messages will go out and people will hear them and they will be, people will be converted because of what people say under those circumstances. Well, what p practical things could we do in our church, our, our own church today, our own churches, you out there, what practical things could you do in your church to make, your, make the church a more effective evangelistic ministry? We're in North America now, as an example. What, what things could we do? I think for a start, have some very good greeters at the front door on Sabbath morning. Okay. It's not always there. Not always there? Okay. <laughs> Make people feel welcome? Yes. How good are we at biting, inviting people to church? When we have people that do come to church, maybe we need to give them the right message. Yeah, at least make them feel welcome to start out with, sure. so they want to come back. You know, sometimes I'll have to admit, I'm scared to ask people to come to church. Mm -hmm. I had a wonderful experience some years ago. I will have to tell you, I invited, I haven't had many opportunities like this, but I invited a very well-educated woman to come to a church, not here, somewhere else. And uh, she came one time and never stopped. Some crazy things happened in her experience. I mean, obviously, you know, and some couple months later, she came to me one day and said, I just asked the pastor, I just asked the pastor if he would baptize me. It's like that. You never know. You don't know what kind of witnesses. So I, I, I think we need to be inviting people. We need, to, we need to be reaching out to people around us and saying, I, I think we are way, way too cautious about doing that kind of stuff. I think that we're, you know, we live and we tend to live in Adventist ghettos. We're, we're saying, oh no, nobody, you know, well, I'm, I'm one of those poor little Adventists and who wants to hear from me? But God has a plan for every one of us and that plan is to carry the gospel to the world and we're not going to go to heaven until that happens and you could be a part of it I could be a part of it and all of us should try to be a part of it now our kind and wonderful father we thank you for the opportunities we have to study these lessons for the things we can learn from the example in this case of Philip especially and Stephen and Paul what they did is just unbelievable. Would that we had the courage to step out as they did and we know the day is coming hopefully soon when circumstances will make it necessary for us to do the same. Help us to have the courage to do that when that time comes is our prayer in Jesus name. Amen.